folks, welcome back to Indaba Africa. This is Chris once again. Hello, folks, and welcome back to the Rugby Ascendant segment of Chris White After. This is Chris. And no, I'm not at Tafel Lager Park in Kimberly. That's just the backdrop. I'm in central Pennsylvania. My special feature guest today has got this awesome, awesome, awesome uh Custom made top on that we'll talk about as we get into it, but none other than Johan Mumpson from Rugby ATL and from the Greek was Johan Hochandit. Hey, Chris. Uh, very good. Good <laughs> donkey. Excellent. All right. So I'm ready this time. I dug out my trusty 1976 Learn to Speak Afrikaans book. I can't see it there. There you go. Learn to Speak Afrikaans. So I brought it out. I thought I'd practice with you a little bit here. And I'm even pulling out some, you know, some reading glasses to make sure I don't miss anything here. So here we go. So uh, this is uh, Die Familie. Uns het un moi hois. Uns von un kerkstrat. Die hois is nie bei rut nie. Ma die is rut genug for uns familie. Okay, how's that? Not too bad? <laughs> very good very good I all right it. <laughs> well that's the bottom line hey uh, johan it's a pleasure to have you back of course for those who follow uh the rugby ascendant segment and the rugby ascendant channel you know that uh they know that you're a lock with rugby atl and we'll talk about that season but you also play in south africa and you played in the curry cup semi-final down there on the east coast against the dreaded sharks we'll talk about that today but tell us a little bit about that shirt you got on that's awesome I, and maybe explain it because viewers might not be able to see it very well yeah, it's a, a limited edition uh, that I picked up here in South Africa. Uh, it's the special, like the, the South Africa and All Blacks, and it's the 100th test uh, between the two coming Saturday. So, yeah, it'll be a special one. So, will this be a 100th test with yellow cards and aren't yellow cards, I wonder? <laughs> <laughs> it's up for the best it's up for the best <laughs> oh my goodness Jasper Visa I call that game live reaction for that game I'm like that is not a yellow card not a yellow card he went for the ball and of course uh the uh Sansar says in fact it wasn't a yellow card but they didn't hold a meeting no. so Jasper's out of the game now I, I disagree I know that the rules are complicated but for Faf de Klerk they're saying that in Faf it wasn't a yellow card that's where rugby says uh, but it was definitely cynical. He was told by the official to back off. So I, 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 I don't yeah. dispute that yellow card, but uh, Faf does. Oh, my sound went out. Yeah, Is it... uh, uh, Go, it's ahead. On, uh... Go ahead. It's on for me. Okay. Yeah, well, no, I, I, I also think Faf's was a little cynical. Uh, he had to go at it twice and the ref told him to stop and then, then he went for it again. So, and uh, yeah, they had a lot of momentum on that stage. So it's probably a little fair. Yeah, that really, it really did seem to change the game. Um, so let's get back to this. All right, so you you played with Major League Rugby this year for Rugby ATL, quite a season. Now, this was the first season, the fourth season in Major League Rugby history, but the first season that we had conferences. So you guys had a you had a tough uh, slog. The Eastern Conference is very difficult with, with Rooney and um, also other competitors like uh, coming up on your heels there. And it went down to the wire, but you did win the, the top of the log. And then you had the... Championship, Eastern Conference Championship there in Marietta, Georgia, just outside Atlanta. I went to that game and you guys prevailed. That was a heck of a game. It was a tough one. Uh, any thoughts or comments about that Eastern Conference final? Yeah, it was definitely a tough one. Uh, the weather also, it's, uh, it's been a while now, but I think uh, as far as I can remember, the weather didn't allow for too too much running rugby, like usually actually in Atlanta. Um but uh, it was it was good. I think we were we were behind most of the game. Uh, it was nine three for a long long time, and uh, we had to push through. And pretty much right at the end, we uh, we had some two or three good mauls uh, brought down a few times, and then we we pushed over with the forwards eventually. Uh, hard work tried, but uh, yeah, that that really summed up our season for for a good bit. I think uh, that was that was. What we had to do a lot of the times, just just graft hard in the forwards, break them down, use our power, and then score some tries. Um, yeah, and that was a very special victory for our team. But uh, a lot of people said that, uh, that this was uh, kind of stacked in the favor of, of, of Los Angeles, but I didn't agree with that. I mean, with the signings they had with Adam Ashley Cooper and Matt Guido, DTH Van der Merwe, but I think that you guys uh, matched up pretty well against them. Of course, I came to Atlanta early in the season, and you actually defeated them on your home turf. So was there a big difference when you went to this championship game against the Giltinis, that something that stood out that uh, made it difficult for you guys? Because it looked as though um, L.A. had a pretty easy time uh, sorting out what you guys had planned. Yeah, I think uh, 
if I have to go back, uh, comparing the two games, they definitely did their homework in the second one. I think maybe in the first one they did uh, underestimate us a little bit. Uh, but also, again, the weather in Atlanta definitely played a role. Uh, they are a team that likes running the ball, and uh, you cannot do that in Atlanta with the wet ball. It's just for people that don't know, it's so humid. Um, it's it's really hard holding on to the ball for phases, and uh, that's what they managed to do in California with the dry ball. And, uh, yeah, they put us under pressure. They sped up the rucks. We couldn't slow it down. And, uh, yeah, they just they, they got the gaps in our defense that, no one could really do this season. Well, you make a really good point there, Johan, and specifically the point that you brought out is uh, Atlanta is incredibly humid. And, you know, I, I go to games down there. I, got to, I watch guys warm up, and you can feel the humidity. It actually wasn't that bad the times I've been there, but but it picks up at times. That's really changes the nature of the game. There's, there's two things in Major League Rugby uh, that have really had an impact. Number one is a lot of the a lot of the games are played on artificial turf. I'm sure you guys don't like that. <laughs> I'd, I'd rather, mm-hmm. I mean, I'd rather pay play on the on the concrete at at Tagalog or, or at, at Tagalog Field, <laughs> Tafalaga, Sorry, than I would want to play on artificial turf. I played artificial turf, and those burns are terrible. They're hard to heal from. But so that's one thing that's that real because the ball bounces completely differently. I mean, that really has an impact yeah. on the kicking game. But then, as you mentioned, which is something a lot of people overlook, is that is that with humidity, the ball is really hard to hold on to. I mean, so I've seen a lot of talented rugby players with knock-ons, and you wouldn't normally have knock-ons if that ball wasn't so wet. Yeah, uh, it's, I, 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 I want to compare it to like a very rainy game, but it's mm-hmm. even worse. Uh, I feel like sweat is even more slippery than water. So it, it really is that wet. It feels like it's raining, but it's dry. Um, so if you have to go play a game there, it's probably going to have to be a, a wet ball type of mindset. Um, so, yeah, that's that, that really, I think, something that, that, that worked for us, playing more conservative rugby there. And, uh, yeah, something that teams will adjust to in the coming seasons. Well, I, I get your point. I could certainly see uh, playing in the rain every time the ball comes at you, you know, you got a grip, you got to be ready for it. It's probably preeminent in your mind. But when you're playing in, cle- in, in clear conditions and it's just human, the ball is coming at you, you're probably focusing on who's coming at you, what move you're going to make, if you're going to offload it, and then the ball just squeezes right out of your hands. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 100%. If someone just hits you anywhere around the ball, it just pops out. Just squeezes out like it's got butter all yeah. over it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Really, really slippery. Well, you know, I just realized something, Johan, because my microphone wasn't transmitting at the beginning. I, I, I won't have to worry about embarrassing myself when I was practicing my offer content when it first started. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. It was good. Was, okay, so only you heard it. So <laughs> the, the audience will have to take your take your word that it was good. Yeah, but uh, so let me ask you this question: The LA Coliseum is an iconic stadium. Now, I realize there weren't 100,000 people there. So, But, you know, when you go to a UCLA game or something like that, and there's 100,000 people at the Coliseum. It's just an amazing atmosphere. But but the stadium itself is iconic in sports stadiums. It kind of, you know, like Newlands, Eden Park, uh, Twickenham. These are, you know, top pitches in rugby. But for American football, uh, the Coliseum, something else. What was it like playing in the L.A. Coliseum? Was it, was it a different kind of atmosphere for you, even though the crowd was about 5,000 or so? Yeah, it, I, I feel like it was uh... – very special occasion. Uh, I've only seen it and heard about it. Um, saw a lot of pictures of it, so it was it was really cool to play there. Um, and it was a, a great pitch, uh, world class pitch. Honestly, uh, the grass, the it's not not thick, so it was, it was almost like you're running on turf, uh, like on, under your feet, uh, which is a, for for people that don't know, it's a, it's a quick type of pitch. So you can run, you don't get really tired, and the ball bounces nicely, um, but also very level. There wasn't any holes in the pitch. So it was it was really, really good com- compared to anything I've played on. Well, that's a great point because not only, as you mentioned, is it level and you don't have to worry about any divots and things like that, plus yeah. the grass is so maintained that you're not seeing it just rip up all the time like you see in a lot of mm. places. Uh, but you can pick up that speed. You can build that up in the, and, and dart down the, uh, the the course. But the other thing is that when you hit the ground, it's a lot more comfortable than hit the ground, say, on artificial turf. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Definitely the, 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 the turf definitely cuts up your skin pretty na- uh, pretty nastily, so... It's not always not always fun playing on that. 
It was uh, interesting watching the HSBC seven series this past weekend. As the weekend progressed, more and more athletic tape was on the forearms and the shits <laughs> of all the teams that were yeah, the knees and teams advancing. I mean, we laugh, it's yeah. but it's not funny. I mean, Vancouver, BC place is a nice place to visit, uh, but it's a tough place to play rugby. I think that the turf had uh, about five times as many tackles as any team had during this tournament. It, it was uh, everywhere you went, the uh, the turf was tackling players, people losing their footing everywhere. But I, as yeah. you said, in L.A., um, that's not the case. That's a really good pitch. Uh, you, you, you dig your cleats in and, you know, you know that your footing is be, is going to be there. If, if you plant, you don't have to worry about your ankle folding under because that's uh, it's going to hold. So let me let yeah. me switch a little bit here. So. Um, you went back to South Africa after the uh, the final. And by the way, congratulations on the Eastern Conference Championship and on getting to the Thank final. You. You're very welcome. Yep. It was very exciting. Um, a little anticlimactic you know, with the loss, but I mean, you know, somebody's got to win. So, but you Someone's are got to lose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you are Eastern Conference champions and the first ever. So that's awesome. Quite an accomplishment mm -hmm. in a tough conference. You went back to South Africa, and then like just like minutes later, you were playing with the Greek was uh, in the semifinal for for the um for the curry cup now did you get back before that game or is that the first game you got in no no i got back probably three weeks before that and uh played the last four games so yeah since i got back i played all of them all of them off the bench um but yeah can't expect anything else i mean skip skip the first nine games of the season so um but it was it was good to be back uh good to play some more curry cup and uh yeah, well, just playing rugby, all oh, that's that's what we do it is to play. Well, absolutely. Well, the thing for me is that uh, now, okay, and it's just a full disclosure. I think uh, Johan may already know this, but I'm a Western Province fan first and foremost, so I'm crying in my beer frequently these days. But um, whenever the Greek was play, whoever they play, even against Western Province, I kind of pull for them. I've always had a soft spot for the Greek was uh, not not only just because of the name and the origin, the people that it represents, but the location and just you know the fact that they're willing to play on concrete there in Kimberley, you know. <laughs> You got to have respect. You got to have respect for that. But uh, so I always pull for the Greek was and and uh, last year I was pulling for them when they did well. First time in ages, it seemed. And then this year uh, they were up and down, but they were mostly up. And, and I was really looking forward. I was hoping they get to the final. And actually, uh, it looked pretty ugly from a, a Greek fan standpoint there in the semifinal till late in the game. Uh, you came off the bench and I'm like, that looks like Johan Mumpson. No, uh -huh. is that? Yeah, it is. I saw a line out, a beautiful line out. And then right towards the end of the game, like the 79th minute, um, you guys rolled across and you got the try. What was that like? I mean, you, you almost came back there and that made it 28 to 24. Yeah, that was my first Curry Cup try. So it was, it was special. That was my, for now, the last Curry Cup game I've played. So it was, it was pretty special getting the, getting the one Curry Cup try. And uh, yeah, like you said, came on. Try to make an impact, made a line break, and got the got the try at the end. It was just too bad; it was too late. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's how, that's the way it goes. Someone, like you said, someone's got to lose. But it was still quite an impressive effort by the Greek was. I mean, it still almost snatched it. I mean, that was in 79th minute. You got you got the uh, got the ball back and a chance to uh, to 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 get another try, but just too, just too far away. Mm. But uh, of course, uh, earlier in that game, there was a try that the Greek was scored um, and that I was a little mm -hmm. disappointed that was called back. It was called um, that the ball was knocked on forward, but you know, watching it live and watching it in a replay, I don't see how the ball is knocked forward when it goes laterally. And then the Greek player picks it up behind the opposition from, from in front of him, actually, you know, so I don't, I don't know how, but, and then, and that was about a good, you know, I don't know, a few phases and about 45 seconds before the try was actually scored by, is it, um, what's his name? Is it Elv, is Elvin, uh, Vandermeer? what's the guy's name? The wing. I think it was. Uh, who scored that try? Wasn't it Ashland? No, it wasn't Ashland Davids. No, uh, it was. I, I, uh, anyway, whichever the case is. I don't that, know who scored that. Well, yeah, because it didn't count. <laughs> it was taken off the table. <laughs> <laughs> so can't blame you for not remembering it was taken off. But I mean, but that made a big difference. And then uh, so George Whitehead is, is your fly half, right? Yes. Yeah, he had a great season and uh, he had a great game here. But but uh, imagine it, he missed he missed one kick. I thought he was going to make early in the game. It wasn't the easiest, but he's been pretty reliable. And if he made that, the final would have been twenty eight to twenty seven. Not not that you would have won, but wow, it's, it's so it's down the knife's edge. I mean, you came in there late in the game. You had an impact. Like I didn't realize it was your first ever Curry Cup try. Do do they do they let you keep the ball when you get something like that or no? 
<laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, man. no nothing like that. <laughs> no, the balls, the balls usually just go back with it becomes training balls. So no, <laughs> no one keeps them. <laughs> shame, 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 shame. But uh, what was it like getting back into competition over there in South Africa? And can you compare and contrast a little bit with what the major league rugby season was like over here in the US? Um yeah, it was it was it was a lot of fun to come back. Uh the Greek was was it's it's a it's a nice transition coming back to to a team and nothing's really changed. It's the bulk of the squad was the same as we had last year, so it's a easy transition to make. You you really know the coaches, you know the players, you know most of the plays. So so it's, yeah, that was that was nice. Um, and then playing Curry Cup, it was easier to compare it this year because I can straight I came straight from the MLR to the Curry Cup. And uh, if I have to draw a comparison, it's for me, it just felt like a, a lower error rate of all. But now I don't know if it's only Atlanta because of the humidity anymore. Um, the, the the difference is not that big, um, which is a big compliment to MLR. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I don't know. Maybe just, it's, a, it's really a tough one to make, but I, not not a big difference if I have to just, just make it simple. It's, yeah, it's very, very close. Well, you said you were there for the last four games. Um what about travel? Obviously, South Africa is a big country, but it's a bit smaller than the U.S. to say the least. So, yeah. was the travel easier going back to South Africa than here in the states, or what? Uh yeah, the travel. I, I at least missed the two bus rides. Uh, Greek was Greek was is because of its central uh, position in the country. Uh, it's it's almost easier and cheaper to draw, to have bus rides than fly with with the planes, and it's. Yeah, it's it's central, but it's out of the way of everything. I don't know, it's weird. But so we don't fly everywhere. We have bus rides. I missed the two long bus rides. Uh, when I got back, we flew everywhere. So that was that was good. Um, but the travel, the longest travel you'll get on a on a plane is like a two hours. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's. I wouldn't say it's a lot different. Uh, although you do fly for about five hours with layovers. So travel, if you go. In US, if you go from the Eastern to Western Conference, it's a pretty long travel. Um, it does get to you sometimes. I know we we started traveling maybe two days ahead sometimes to just get rid of that, what, if you would call it jet lag. Um, so, yeah, it's easier to travel here, definitely. Well, one advantage here is with the Colorado dropping out of the league, at least there's um, no altitude because most of the games are played pretty much at sea level around the country. When Colorado and Glendale and Colorado was in there, there's 5,000 feet. You know, I always get a kick out of Utah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Utah. Yeah, that's right. Utah's still in the league. You guys actually traveled to Utah this year, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, we did. Yeah, that was actually a heck of a game, as I recall. But uh, yeah, so Utah still, that's right. But but I always get a kick out of, um, you know, people like on the high of the altitude is tough for the All Blacks and the Wallabies. And I'm like, it's 2,000 feet. Colorado is 5,000 feet. And, <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> when I lived in Ethiopia, I was at 9,000 feet every single day. You want to talk about gasping for air. You know, uh, Johan, when I first got to Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, the American embassy sits up on the top of a hill. Uh, it goes up further, over 10,000 feet. But I got there and... Um, I go running every day at lunchtime and I'm like, oh, God, I am so out of shape without even thinking about the fact that there's no oxygen at 10,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Uh, it that's wasn't. Why they make some, that's, that's why the Ethiopians make such good uh, long distance athletes. Absolutely. Cause they're accustomed to that low oxygen and, yeah. you know, and, and then also run up those hills, but yeah, no, it's uh, definitely a difference there, but I, I always do get a kick out of, you know, oh the high veld, man, they have an advantage of altitude. I'm like, it's not that big an advantage. It, it is an advantage. <laughs> I'll admit that, but not that big an advantage. Now, when you play in, um, in uh, Kimberly at uh, Tafel Lager, is there any advantage there? Do you guys have a home field advantage in any respect? I mean, unfortunately, crowds aren't usually big, so that's maybe not an advantage. But but is that turf an advantage? Do, do other teams fear coming to Kimberley to play on that turf? Teams hate coming there. It's it's a big <laughs> it's a big advantage, really. Um, it's it's uh, not necessarily even that bad. It it is hard, but it's. I mean, we get used to it. If someone plays a game or two on it, they're like, "Oh yeah, it was hard, but it's not that bad." But really. People just hate coming to Kimberley. It's a small town, also at altitude, and they know about the hot pitch. In the winter, the grass is all dead. It's it's yeah, it's it's just dusty. So I mean, it's maybe it's just their heads beforehand. They already think about it. Uh, but yeah, definitely a big home advantage for us. And that's also the Greek was 
identity really is playing hard rugby. It's uh, yeah, it's just we have to basically be the same as our town is a small and uh, or not. Oh, I mean, just humble and hard. Basically, is the two words. Well, yeah, I got you. Now, Chris Rellinghoist is correct to me. He's saying it. Uh, Ellis Park is five thousand feet. Um, I thought it was eighteen hundred <laughs> meters. Anyway, well, yeah, that's all right. You're welcome to take the correction. Thank you for that, Chris. But uh, no, I get your point. It's a gritty, um, uh, blue collar kind of town, and and a team wants yes. to be a gritty kind of blue collar team. You know, and and I, you made another point there, which I never really thought about. I mean, I've been to Kimberley. Um, I remember um, the first time I went there. By the time I finally arrived, it was dark. It was late at night, and I'm like. Hey, Where's this hotel at? Because I was looking for the protea. And I'm, I'm, where's this? It's supposed to be right here next to the big hole. Where's this hole at? It's like the biggest freaking hole on the planet. I can't find this hole. So I'm driving around and I wound up getting to the hotel and I parked and I checked in. I was tired, went to bed, got up in the morning, uh, stepped outside and I walked around the hotel and I looked and that's where the big hole was. It was right there. <laughs> I mean, it's literally, but I couldn't see that at night. So <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but uh, the point I, I was trying to get at here is that um, other than the big hole, I don't know that there's a whole lot of cultural or um, aesthetic things that people want to visit and touristy sort of things. I mean, if you go to Pretoria, there's plenty to do. If you go to, to Cape town, to Durban for the sharks, lots of things to do. Um, maybe not so much in Bloemfontein for the cheetahs, but, uh, Kimberly, I could see why, you know, the guys from the big city might not enjoy a trip up to Kimberly, not just the turf, but you know, where are the nightclubs, where are they going to hang out? Where are the shopping malls? It's, uh, it's not that kind of town. I mean, is that, is, is that a fair assessment or, or am I off a little bit? <laughs> fair assessment. <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> so Laurie Lettinen, who's, uh, watching us from Finland, uh, says cheers to rugby and just gave a super chat. Laurie, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate it. So. What are you doing now? I mean, the, are, are you are you on the tap or are, is there a chance you'll sign with one of the clubs to play for the URC or something like that and go up to Europe? Or are you just working out and taking time off or bagging groceries, bailing hay? What are you up to? <laughs> no, no, I'm just taking some time off and uh, working out by myself. Uh, I feel like I deserve a break. I mean, from last year, October, when the Super Rugby Unlocked started, was it October? I think October. I, I've I played straight through at two weeks off, started the MLR, went straight into another Curry Cup, another four games. So I've, I've been pretty much around 25, 26 games on the trot now. So I'm enjoying a little break, spending some time with the family. And uh, yeah, and then I'll be back for preseason in Atlanta around December. Wow, that's a quick turnaround. You know, and you make a good point there and, and, and something uh, that a lot of people don't realize. I mean, rugby goes year round. And if you know, guys can wind up playing all over the world throughout the year, and that can be tough on your body. So a break is probably warranted. I mean, I think you're fortunate you didn't really have any serious um, niggles or injuries this season, did you? No, no, no. Touch wood. I was, I was lucky this year. <laughs> Yeah, That's very fortunate. Injuries, yeah, yeah we, I mean, we see a lot of folks go down for this, that, and the other. But uh, you, you, I mean, Kurt Coleman uh, couldn't play early in the season because he was injured, but mm -hmm. then he came on late in the season. But, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty good season for you, but a long one. Like you said, Major League Rugby went a long time. And, and then, of course, it's not just a long season. You also had to deal with that humidity, which kind of kind of pushes <laughs> you hard. <laughs> yeah, uh, definitely. It, uh, you, you do lose some weight during, during season. You can't gym as hard during season, so... Uh, it's good, good to get my body ready for the next good, good all fit and strong for the next season again. Well, a lot of your fellow players there in South Africa, I've got a feel and wonder for them. I mean, you've got, you had the Curry Cup championship from last year, which was pushed into this year. So a few games for that took place this year. Then mm -hmm. you had, uh, for those who make the spring box, you had, you had test rugby coming and then the Curry Cup restarted and then mm -hmm. test rugby is still going on and, and Curry Cup just ended. And now the URC is going on for the Bulls and for Western province and the Lions and uh, for the Sharks. So the guys on those teams, I mean, you, you look at some of these rosters, I'm like, who's that? Who's that? I've never seen that guy yeah. before. Um, you know, and it's because uh, these clubs are forced to bring up a lot of players, either because of injuries or, or guys just wear down. It's a long season. It's a, it's a lot. I mean, when you it's more than one season. We just talked about three seasons there, but um, it's a pretty tough sort of thing. So, what's it like for you? I mean, you enjoy being uh, that big guy on the lineout, being a lock in there in the formation. Is that a position you relish? Yeah, I mean, uh, I do like playing loose forward. Uh, but I mean, everything has its perks. I like being in the middle of the thing. So being in the lock, being in the center of the field, making ball carries, being in the close quarters, making tackles there. I, I do enjoy that. I feel like you're part of everything. Uh, if you're playing loose forward out on the edges, you do 
do get to do some more spectacular things sometimes, score more tries maybe, but you touch the ball way less. Um, so, I mean, like I said, everything has their pros and cons, but I, I enjoy wherever I play. I mean, as long as you get your minutes, it's good. That's why we play. Well, what, Johan, what's what's your favorite part about being a rugby player? And, and maybe compare it, the two, two, let's do two ways. Uh, when you're an amateur, when you were playing as a kid or playing at school, compare that, what was your favorite part about that? And, and is it the same now that you're a professional and you actually get a, get a few ran for playing? Or, or, or has it changed? Is there something different now that you're a professional that you like better? Oh, that's a tough question, Chris. Um, I think the, the the good thing and the nice thing about playing when you're a youngster is there's no pressure. You can just exp- just express yourself. You just play. Um, but in professional rugby, there's definitely more pressure. When you make mistakes, you get called out on it. Um, I mean, you still want your freedom. You still want to just play. But um, yeah, the, the, being professional is... Yeah, I mean that's what you dream of. It's 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 a job. You get paid to do it. Uh, so it's it's probably we always say it's the best job I've ever, ever had. So most of us, it's the only job we've ever had. But I can't I can't think about doing anything else currently. It's it's a, it's a dream come true. Um, being able to to make a living out of playing the sport you love. It's they always say when you love what you do, it doesn't feel like you're doing something. So. It's the, I mean, playing rugby profession is probably the perfect example of that. No, it's an excellent example. You know, it's, and you're right. If you enjoy what you're doing, it's not really work. I mean, it's work, but it doesn't feel like it. Yeah. And it's not like, oh gosh, when will five o'clock get here? Cause I punched my time no. card sort of thing. It's not, I mean, I could say the same. I, I spent 36 and a half years in the army and while there were definitely down times and getting shot at wasn't so much fun, but, but um, much of my time, I, I relished uh, the fact that I wore a uniform. I look forward to what I was going to do each and every day, especially my time in Africa. Cause I, I, I could see it making a difference and and, cha- and making an impact on history. It was pretty cool. Well, let me ask you this question. So, you know, Eventually, we all move on. I couldn't stay a soldier forever. I had to retire at some point. They won't let you stay till you're 100. Uh, and uh, not that I'm anywhere near 100, by the way. But uh, and Johan, <laughs> you know, you're young um, in the game, but eventually it'll be time to move on from rugby. I mean, you know, even guys like Victor Matfield come back for a second hurrah. Eventually, they have to t- retire too. So, what's your future plans, or do you have future plans at this stage? Will you become a real estate magnate, or you know, the world's biggest farmer in that part of the country, or, or are you going to get into something else or broadcasting? Have you thought about a future down the road, let's say in ten or twelve years, when you finish with rugby? Because I've, I've, it's definitely on my mind a lot, and my mom also puts pressure on me for that. Uh, but I, oh, I graduated Stellenbosch University uh, with a business degree double majored in financial management and investment management so that is what i am planning to do but i would oh i've just been thinking about it all the more these days but i would love to go into coaching too so if, if, if a coaching job arises somewhere i would love to do that um, otherwise i would i would go into the financial management or investment management probably to to the financial sector and do my thing there. Well, the financial sector might be more financially rewarding, but from a, a <laughs> self-actualization standpoint, perhaps coaching yeah. might be something you'd be better suited to, but uh, not better suited to, but you'd, you'd get more out of. I, I saw that uh, Adam Ashley Cooper is signed as an assistant coach with the Guiltinis after that season. Yeah. I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> Good on so, well, there's maybe, maybe there's, maybe there's a path for you down the road that way. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's pretty cool. So you say your mom is, is, is hitting you up about what you're going to do down the road. Is she concerned about your future or is she just being a mom? No, she's just being a mom. She always, she always wants me to do more. She's always on my case to just maybe do some, a little bit more studying. If you, if you get the chance to do more studying, you can never, have enough knowledge you can never stop studying basically is what she's saying uh anything you do extra counts in your favor so no it's, it's she's not pressuring me into anything she's just giving a good mom's advice well that's good to hear and there's some chat over here of people talking about faf and, and and now and rossi's been mentioned hey by the way if you become very famous in the rugby world there's always a future of being a famous water boy i mean we've seen the examples <laughs> <laughs> we've seen the examples set now by rossi did you see him yeah. in the British and Irish Lions series or were you too busy? <laughs> no, no, I saw him. I saw him. No, he was coaching from the sidelines. Let's <laughs> coach it from the field. He was on the field, from coach. The field. <laughs> yeah, oh my gosh. Yeah. He's walking out there. He's like, like, hold the water. Like, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, now, so what you guys got to do is, you know, build those phases up. 
<laughs> it's definitely the best water boy you're gonna ever have well no doubt about it he's definitely the most famous water boy in history it's uh, we definitely yeah. won't forget that one <laughs> pretty interesting so let, let me shift gears a little bit here from from uh yourself and myself and and ask you um you don't have to commit if you don't want to but everybody's talking about this so uh wow um the uh, spring box of course after a very long layoff last year being all messed up because of the rona pandemic uh but then they get back on the pitch this year they have an interesting game against georgia the second one canceled because of all the positive tests and then they play what i consider the most sleep inducing narcoleptic and uh sort of uh, british and irish lion series in in my life I, I i had a hard time staying awake watching it, it was very boring rugby by both sides uh, all, all the carping uh, by Warren Gatlin and by Rossi aside about officiating and that sort of thing. Mm. Throw that out. But the games weren't particularly interesting. But they won two of the three. And then they beat the Pumas twice. That was okay. Nothing exciting. But that was the games were good. So they go five and one. And they go to Australia. And they squeeze the game out and lose it in the last seconds there. And, boy, I'll tell you, Quay Cooper had the game of his life there, 23 points. Um Wow. Um, now they're offering him citizenship after denying it five times. <laughs> that, was a great, that was a great game for Quay Cooper, you know, but um, so that that was disappointing. But I, I don't know. You don't have to. I, I feel free. I, I feel free because I'm, I'm doing this as a journalist. But uh, my, my description of the game last week in Brisbane was the Springboks were the walking dead. They were the springless box. It was really, really sad to watch that game. Uh, very disappointing on so many levels. Uh, I felt the yellow card against Jasper Visa was wholly unwarranted. Uh, as we said, I, I, I thought the one on, on Faf de Klerk was warranted, and that changed the game. 12 points scored just like that. But um, are you concerned about the Spring Bucks for the rest of this test season? Or are you thinking about them at all? Or do you think they got anything left in the tank? Because now there's a lot of, now, well, yeah, it's the All Blacks. We always play tough again. They bring out the best in us. Well, they got a lot to bring out compared to the last two weeks. Any thoughts on this uh, this first test this weekend against the uh, the All Blacks? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the the Springboks are getting a lot of stick for the gameplay they're playing. Um, it is a game plan that's that works. It's it's proven to work. Um, but to do that, you have to get the basics right. You have to keep on to the ball. You you can't concede penalties because the whole game plan is based on keeping the team in their half. That's why we kick that much. Um, but exceeding penalties in their half just brings them back there for more set piece. And uh, and also, I mean, you have to have a strong defense. And our defense has been on and off in games, making a lot of errors. Um, so, oh, there we go. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's a focus thing or if the guys are burnt out, like you say, but I do feel like people say the All Blacks brings out the best in us. That is true. So I do feel like they can turn it around. I don't know if it'll be good enough to beat the All Blacks. Uh, it's going to be a tough one. Uh, but yeah, excited to see it, but also a little concerned. <laughs> yeah, same same here. Um, I think I read that the the All Blacks are bringing Bowden Barrett back. Uh, that made me nervous just hearing that. That's not, that's not a good sign because he's he, he, that guy is just he's he's amazing. He's an amazing rugby player. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be tough. But uh, you're wearing this really cool custom made 100th test between the Springboks and the All Blacks. 100 test. Wow. Can you believe it? I mean, they've been playing for over a century and it's just 100 tests. There must have been several years when they didn't play probably because of the apartheid era and they wouldn't play. That probably messed up the total count. But 100 tests, that's, that is an epic event. I think a lot of people haven't really paid much attention to that. Obviously, you have. You went out and got this really cool jersey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been advertised in South Africa quite a lot. There was a, on our DSTV, which is the, this, uh, the satellite, um, they have a whole special package uh, I'd say a preview of like an hour or two about the game and old pundits and old players talking about it for the, from the history point of view. And uh, yeah, so they, they definitely made a bigger thing here than I think maybe worldwide. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure it's a big thing in New Zealand too. I'm sure the Kiwis, I mean, mm -hmm. they, they, they live and breathe. I mean, as I've said, uh, when, when a child comes out of the womb, it has a mini rugby ball in its hand. That's part of the birth <laughs> package in, 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 in New Zealand. So I'm sure they made a big deal about it too, but I mean, it should be epic. Now I assume you're going to be watching the game. Yep. No, definitely. I'll be watching. Cool beans. Now let me ask you about this, this United rugby championship thing where they, uh, 
Pro 14, I think, did the Cheetahs and the Southern Kings wrong, although the Southern Kings went bankrupt, so it wouldn't have mattered anyway, by dumping them out of the competition and then bringing the other four teams up there, arguably because of the stronger South African sides. Um, uh, will you be following the United Rugby Championship at all? It starts uh, tomorrow. The Lions play. I think they play the Zebras. And then the huge match, well, we'll see if the Bulls can stand up to it, but the huge match billed for this weekend is Leinster, the champions against uh, the Bulls on Saturday. Are you going to follow any of that United Rugby Championship or is he just going to, you know, you're focused on, on relaxing and, and uh, getting your mind off rugby for a little bit? No, I'll be watching. Uh, I don't know if I'll be following it or every single game, but I'll definitely... I'll be, I'll be watching a few of them. I still have a bunch of friends playing there, so it'll be fun to watch. And uh, it'll be good to see how our teams uh, actually meet up against the, the Europe, uh, European sides. They, uh, they play a really professional brand of rugby over there. So as you could see, ben Benetton beat the Bulls already. Oh, so, oh 38 um, to 5 or something like that. Yeah, that was brutal. Yeah. Benetton yeah, didn't, they, win, they didn't win a single game during the season. Yeah. Oh. No, so I mean, so it's it, it'll be interesting to see the they played a completely different type of rugby, um, and it's also it's also tough there. It's it's really cold. Apparently, I, I've been speaking to a bunch of the Kings and Cheetahs guys who did play in the Pro 14, like you said, and they said it's 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 horrible. The the the, the cold is something else. It's it's different than humidity. It's different than wet weather. It's it's just your hands are frozen, your feet are frozen. It's just, yeah, dreadful. <laughs> okay, so I, I have to intercede here with editorial comment, Johan. Uh, for my non-South African audience around the globe, let's just point something out. South Africans love to whinge about the cold. When it's 18 degrees Celsius, they're complaining it's cold. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not 18, call it 10, call it 10. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah, no, but, no, but South Africans seem to be much more attuned to when it gets cold than folks in Europe because mm. they're accustomed to it. That's a good point, though. I mean, the season runs from September 24th till May. So, yeah. so South Africans are going to have to get some kid out there to stay warm or get some heaters on the sidelines because they're going to have to get used to that very quickly. Uh, we'll, yeah. we'll see what happens. But, uh, no, I think it will be very interesting to see how – the South African sides match up against uh, the the Celtic nations and the Italians up there. It should be should be fascinating. I have never done fantasy rugby team before, but I have a fantasy URC team. <laughs> so we'll see how it does this weekend. Um, I, I I've, my focus was I'd focus on the four South African teams, but you get limits on how many players you can get from a team. So once you run out, you got to shift around. So I, I did pick a few of the top quality players from some of the sides up there, like Leinster and Munster and and and, mm -hmm. and places like that. But I've never done fantasy rugby before, so we'll see how it goes. But uh, I've done fantasy football before. I banned American football here in the states, and I was always pretty good at that. I suspect I'll be better at the American fantasy football than I will be at rugby. But looking forward to it. <laughs> And, you know, here I had to pay for a package so that I could watch it. Um, I'm sure you get it on DSTV on Super Sport. You'll be able to watch the games yeah. in South Africa. But here I had to pay for it. Uh, so whatever. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. My plan is to try to cover as many of the South African games as I can, uh, although I'm not sure I'm going to cover the Lions tomorrow. So let me ask you this question. You guys are headed towards spring. You spent spring and summer in the States. You come back to South Africa. You're rolling out of winter into spring. Um, I take it you don't miss winter at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't miss winter. Um, I think South African winter would have been fun. Uh, it's not that cold. It just rains a bunch. But uh, no, I don't miss. I mean, Atlanta is not, apparently not cold, but I, I get, it's cold for me. So <laughs> see, I, see, there you go. <laughs> there you go, folks. I just told you about South Africans whinging about the cold weather. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> That's funny to hear somebody say somebody say that Atlanta is not cold, or, 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 but it's cold for them. Yeah, I agree. Atlanta's not cold. I mean, I was walking around shorts down there in all the weather. I mean, wintertime, not a problem. But yeah, no, it's definitely a change. But I think, honestly, I mean, let, let me ask you, Johan. I mean, I, and I think you've, made, you've said it kind of clearly earlier. Probably the biggest challenge is maybe not the chill that you find there and that sort of thing or the brutal heat this summertime, but it's that humidity. And it's an oppressive humidity, isn't it? Yeah. No, it's – it's. I mean, we talked about uh... – talked about the slippery ball but it's not even just that uh we also talked about uh, altitude but it's 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 tough on your lungs playing that humidity it's it's really heavy air that you're breathing in um so it really takes a bunch out of you and uh also just uh, if i can use an example there was one game where i sweat so much i think i lost about seven kilograms in one game so wow you're really drained you're really really drained after one game um and uh, I mean, if you train there every day, you, you have to do your best to get all your electrolytes and nutrients back in. 
Um, if you don't look after yourself, the humidity really gets to you. Um, you can cramp and you can feel bad. And so it's, it's, a, it's a completely different thing I had to get used to. Uh, but yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a new, new challenge, which is fine. Well, it's, it's, uh, let me ask this question. Is, is it better or the same as Durban in the summertime? Is Durban the same with humidity or is, is Atlanta worse? I suspect no, Atlanta's Atlanta. worse. At- Atlanta's worse. Yeah, Atlanta's <laughs> worse. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I would agree with that. <laughs> so there's some comments in the in, in the uh, in the chat here. And Hendo, who's in the UK, he's from from uh, Western Cape. Uh, he's like, uh, Stormers are going to struggle. Yeah, I, I know. I'm not happy. Uh, yeah. He says cheetahs, but the cheetahs aren't playing, brother. Catch up. The Bulls will do okay. We'll see if the Bulls do okay. After that Benetton game, I was really embarrassed. Uh, and he said the Sharks will struggle. I think that's probably going to be the case. But uh, Kerwin Bosch has done a great job with the Sharks this year. So we'll see how he does. Now, Hank, has a, Hank Klopper, he's a big rugby fan, says, okay, he's being cheeky. He says, does Johan wear two court broca in winter? <laughs> 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 no, no, I'll just uh, maybe two, two, two pairs of pants, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is short. I think it's shorts. I think of those guys, yan, yan, yan. Those guys running around. You know that group? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, was it uh, Chris Redlinghoist, uh, who's from South Africa, but he lives in Columbus, Ohio. And he said, it's 52 here, Fahrenheit. So that must be, 52 must be about, I know, a, 10 or 12 degrees uh, Celsius, I'm yeah. guessing. He said uh, he's freezing. Oh, man, 52. I'm in heaven. I'd be wearing shorts for sure there. <laughs> and then and Hendo says, uh, Chris is a Viking. We're not. So good point there. <laughs> maybe, maybe Long John's. That's a good one there. Yikes. Oh, that's good. That's yeah. Good. So so was it good to get back to South Africa? I mean, did you miss it? I mean, I would imagine you did after all this time. And, and when you got back, was it any less crazy with the lockdown than when you left? Or was it still just as annoying? No, it's it's definitely less crazy. Um, we're pretty much back to normal. It's just we still got our curfews. That means everything. Oh, yeah, everything closes. It it was when I got here. Was curfew was at ten. So if you were at the restaurant or a bar, you had to leave at nine. Um, be back in your in your house by ten. Now it shifted from ten to eleven. Okay. So so uh, I mean that's that's still a little bit annoying, but. Uh, everything else is back to normal at least uh still wearing masks um but uh way less crazy than than the one i left here last year for sure now one thing we have to give credit to as major league rugby is that um they, they, they started under a lot of restrictions. Of course, we saw that you shared your facilities with the Toronto Arrows who relocated from Canada down to Atlanta for the season because they couldn't cross the border. And te- so that, that was an odd situation. Really tough on the, the guys from Toronto, but they, they, they buckled up and, and did their best. Not the best season for them, but that happened. But Major League Rugby had all these controls and measures in place, and we really didn't see players disappearing because of testing positive throughout the season for the most part. And they started with no fans. Then in many jurisdictions, they're allowed to have some fans. And then eventually the stadiums are allowed to be filled up. And people came out. I mean, we saw that in Atlanta. A lot more people came out when the restrictions are lifted. But I, I have to credit Major League Rugby, and I don't know if, if, you, if you have any thoughts on this, about what I think was a, a very solid plan. We saw baseball, Major League Baseball struggle here. We saw the NFL struggle with, 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 the, uh, with the pandemic and lots of sports around the world. Um, even test rugby, like for the spring box, we mentioned the Georgia game had to be canceled because so many guys tested positive, but major league mm. rugby seems to have figured something out and I'm really impressed and I, and, and kudos and compliments to them. Uh, what were the protocols and regimens difficult for you guys? And, uh, do you think that they worked out? Yeah, I mean, it definitely worked out. Uh, like you can see in the numbers, no, no, got, not one game got canceled. I think that was the up till the point where it finished, that was the only competition that 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 went through without any games being cancelled. Um, I'm not sure about any games where some players even had to withdraw because of it. Um, so yeah, the the stuff they put in place was was brilliant. It all worked, and uh, yeah, it was nothing really that disrupted us. Um, maybe in the beginning of the season, we couldn't use all our facilities. Not not all of us could be in the same place at once. But uh, as soon as the season started, all of that was gone. We went on like normal, um, and I think even from the start, we had a we had fans at our first game, twenty five percent, and then three or four games later, it went to fifty percent, and towards the end, we had a full full packed stadium. So now it was brilliant. Uh, it was a lot of fun, and then coming back here, yeah, no fans again. So Ugh. yeah, 
uh, brilliant. Uh, I mean, it was really good to play there with, with people. Now, Ken Aronston says, what if the box surprise us on Saturday? Okay, um, before before Johan answers. All right, so you guys know that I have Rugby Senate. That's a sister channel I started because of censorship on this platform. Uh, so that's just rugby. I put my interviews up there. This will be loaded up on there a little bit later this interview, even though I'm streaming on my, my main channel. And I, uh, in all the uh, games, I do live reaction. I will be up at 3 a.m. tomorrow night or tomorrow, the next day's morning, covering this game, live reactionary. And if you think I was excited with the Springboks playing the Wallabies. If the Springboks win this game, I won't have a voice Saturday evening. I will be ranting and screaming and yelling and cheering uh, the likes of which you haven't seen. So if you want to see some excitement, instead of listening to the boring commentators on Supersport, turn on Rugby Senate, listen to my audio while you watch the game on Supersport. Now, the only thing that messes this up is if my feed is ahead or behind yours. And sometimes that happens by a few seconds, but just disregard that. If you see the Springboks score trying on behind, then just wait five or 10 seconds for the excitement and vice versa. Let me blow the secret to you and let you know they scored a try before you see it on TV. Anyway, so that's <laughs> so uh, if the Springboks uh, pull it off and, and surprise us, um, a lot of people say they're all better, but I think that some of the woes that are there, the, the mistakes that they're making still need to be cleaned up and their focus needs to be there. It's kind of missing. Now, let me ask you this question, Johan. Do you want to answer that? Or do you want to say something? What if the Springbok surprises? Do you think they'll surprise us on Saturday? Who knows? <laughs> good, good, good answer. Springboks won, a, <laughs> Springboks won a World Cup. No one expected them to. So, I mean. Ah, yes, no, I no, mean, no, 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 no. I, predict, I predicted they win the World Cup. The only thing I got wrong about the World Cup <laughs> is I, I thought they would win the first game against the All Blacks. And I was there. It was oh, yeah. heartbreaking to watch that game. Um, it was Cheslin Colby was amazing. And we still lost that game. But, yeah, no, I predicted they win that World Cup. Honest. But, that you know, I'm, I'm biased. So, it's not exactly, you know, <laughs> it's not exactly an independent thought there. Okay. Let me ask you this question. You played all over the United States now. I mean, you played – New Jersey or not New Jersey, New York at St. John's. I was at that game. Uh, you've played in Atlanta, of course, the Coliseum in Los Angeles, Seattle, Utah. Do you have a favorite pitch from having been to these different stadiums around the country? Is the one that stands out for you? I'm going to guess it's one that doesn't have artificial turf. Now just make that assumption. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, uh, I think my favorite pitch was Austin. Austin at an awesome stadium uh, and a very cool vibe too. Um, yeah, I think that they're playing at some uh, some soccer teams stadium. Uh, well, they're sharing it with them, but it was just very similar to the Coliseum, uh, but just a better vibe because of the more compact stadium. I think so. Yeah, I think uh, well, I have to say, I was I was still the favorite. Uh, the what do we what, the snake pit. Yeah, um, uh, we have we have a really good artificial turf. It's built for rugby. Uh, I mean, Life University has a very good uh, rugby program, so it's it's not a artificial turf that was made for soccer like most of the others. Uh, ours are a little thicker, a little softer, so uh, it's not as hard as the others. So I, I still still like that one the most with the vibe. But uh, the 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 best field probably uh, I have to say Austin was Austin was my favorite. No, it's pretty cool. You know, um, one of my uh, moderators, um, a guy I mentioned earlier, Hendo, who's from Western Cape, but lives in the UK, always likes to come out and give me a hard time because he says that uh, I do all these dodgy rugby interviews with all the Western province players. And he lumped you into the Western province. And I said, no, 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 Johan is a Greek player. He's not a Western province guy. I know he's down there, but, and he was at Stellenbosch, but, but uh, he says, you know, I keep all the Western province players locked in my basement. That's how come I do all these rugby interviews. <laughs> <laughs> And that, that, that came from Rugby ATL because, uh, let's be honest, there's a lot of folks with affiliations with Western Cape that are playing. And, also, and not just that, but uh, it's interesting because it seems like a third of the Atlanta squad is South Africans, and it definitely makes for a different vibe. Did you guys uh, spend a lot of time this year teaching Americans about Bri and Biltong and, and things like that? Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. We had a bunch of Bri's. Uh, well, Let's let's call it a barbecue because we didn't use wood. But, uh, <laughs> so use <laughs> charc we, use uh, charcoal then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, we did we did buy some budavors for the guys. Nietling uh, Kiraka, it's a, he had a connection there in uh, somewhere in South Carolina, South Carolina, where he um, he bought Boltong drovers and uh, even some budavors from from someone that makes it over there. And uh, yeah, it was uh, the Americans loved it. Uh, he, he bought it in bulk and he sold it again to us. Uh, so there was there was always built on, there was always drawers. And uh, when we had a bribe, we brought some Buddha Wars for the boys. 
So and I think, uh, yeah, everyone, everyone loved it. It's a, it's a fun culture to, to experience. Well, Neitz, uh, I interviewed him as well this season, and uh, I was beginning to wonder if he was just on the roster there just in case. But but he played a lot of time there late in the season and made an impact. Uh, it, was, it was really good to see him on the pitch doing a really good job yeah. there. Yeah, no, Neitz, unfortunately, uh, his body isn't allowing him to play anymore. Uh, I think he's retiring after the season. Oh, he retired after the season. But, uh, yeah, great to have him. A lot of experience and a, a lot of energy. That guy just throws his body around uh, <laughs> with no regard. <laughs> so, so we're not going to see him next year. He's done. He's finished with rugby then? Yeah, as far as I know. He's still he's involved. He's coaching the academy side, and mm-hmm. he'll, be, he'll be still involved there. But, uh, yeah, he's, he said his body doesn't allow it anymore. I think last year in one of the warm-up games, he dislocated his hip. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's, got a, he's got a lot of problems with that. And uh, also, yeah, it, it, it's, it's creating a lot of other problems because of your uh, no it's a good point it was something gets something gets out of alignment it affects everything else like if your foot's wrong your ankle then you adjust your gait and then you mess up another part of your body and yeah i could see that now it's uh well it was great to see him play then i'm really glad i got to see him play in his last season that's pretty cool i guess i'm gonna have to call atlanta and and find out who's in the pipeline from south africa to replace him we gotta get another south african in there (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> one leaves one's got to get in <laughs> exactly exactly but it wasn't just south africans you had an extreme mix you had canadians you had kiwis in the team and you had an american contingent there too so i think that atlanta's uh makeup of its squad was one of the most interesting ones i saw in the league this year with where you get guys from from around the world and how they gelled you, you guys and it, so when i saw your team on the pitch and then watching the course on television as well you really seem to have a sense of team. And I almost want to say family. I mean, is that too much of a stretch? Atlanta really seems to have a bunch of guys that get together and are willing to shift their positions to fill a gap that needs to be filled, even if they're out of position to make the team successful. I mean, is that fair or am I, am I, am I imagining that or is that accurate? No, that's very accurate. Uh, we had a, we have a very special bunch of guys and uh, we also, we all live, I mean, in close proximity, uh, what do you, close proximity, uh, we, we all live in the same apartment complex. So when there is someone that's going to go bry or, or have a barbecue, everyone's invited. Uh, if someone goes to the pool, we're always like 10 guys there. Uh, if someone goes down for a swim in the river, 10 guys join. So it's, it's like you said, it's a family. It's, and because we're so much guys from overseas, we, yeah, we, we, we sort of if each other's family. So I think that's a very fair um, Point you make there, Chris, and uh, I think that's that's what made us special. Well, I'd have to agree. Johan, listen, you've been incredibly generous and um, you didn't hesitate when I reached out to the team to see if I can interview you to talk about the Curry Cup and also about what you're up to. I think it's just nice for our, for our viewers to see what you're up to and taking a break from rugby and staying healthy and um, keeping your mom happy, making sure you're doing something <laughs> useful. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that we've probably drained your mobile battery here. So uh, I think you're off to see a friend's um, oh, next, there we go, yeah. gone to sleep. You're off to see a, a friend. A friend, yeah, it's a friend's birthday party. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go and, and, and say bye bye, Donkey. It's good to see you again. But thank you so much, bye bye, Donkey, for coming on. It's a real pleasure to see you again, Johan. Congratulations on a brilliant performance um, throughout the Major League Rugby season and Eastern Conference Championship, and also um, that try in the Curry Cup semifinal. That was epic, brother. I really enjoyed it, yeah. and I want to say congratulations on that on your first ever try in Curry Cup. And I hope that you have a lovely off season. Thank you, Chris. We'll talk again. All right, cheers. All right, folks, that's Johan. That's Johan Mumpson from Rugby ATL and also from the Greek was. Anyway, Johan, thank you very much. Much I really appreciate it, uh, folks. Thanks for joining me today here live from Toffel Lager Park in Kimberley. No, no, I'm not really. Obviously, it's a green screen. But Johan Mumpson with me talking about uh, his rugby life and a bit about Major League Rugby and Curry Cup. And we chatted also about the Springboks as well as. Uh, the um, United Rugby Champions. Thanks a lot for joining me today on this stream. Johan, once again, thank you very much. Bye-bye, donkey. Que a la bois. 